Okay, today is July 16, 2014. We are at Superpod 3, and we just interviewed journalist Elizabeth Batt. We're here with John Jett, PhD, Samantha Berg, and superstar Ella Van Cleve. Just for background, I googled Ella earlier today, and just her name got 360,000 hits on Google. Wow. I don't know if it's, she's the only one in the world, but <laughs> it seemed like a, a large number. She's the most important. <laughs> she, yeah, and so you know, Ella. Ella was here for Superpod too. She did a fantastic presentation. My first question, Ella, is what are you going to talk about tomorrow night? Um, well, tomorrow night I am hoping to put a presentation together, basically talking about sort of this is, like, I guess, more relevant now, but because the federal government in Canada has actually just given sort of the green light to have the Northern Gateway Pipeline go through BC and through the Great Bear Rainforest and have the tankers, I think it's some, something like 220 a year, go through those waters there. And so I wanted to talk about the impact it would have on the cetaceans and just sort of the wildlife in the area. Okay, I've got a follow-up to that. Last night you came up to me and said something that I said resonated with you, and that was how the captivity issue kind of makes bridges to other issues. It seems to me, based on my interpretation, that maybe the cove was an entry point for you and, and made Blackfish added on and now you branched out and are, are doing a lot of other things. How would you, uh, is that accurate first of all? Can you talk yeah, about that? for sure. I definitely think that, I don't know, as soon as, it's kind of, I feel like that's sort of the way that activism goes. You go in and you kind of latch on to your really individual sort of isolated issue that you end up feeling really passionate about and as you learn more and more about it and sort of the in terms of the specifics, you find that, oh, like this links to that, this links to that, and before you know it, you kind of have gotten this bigger picture where, you know, everything's so intrinsically related and whatnot. So, yeah, I've definitely got a bigger concept of the bigger picture of conservation, not just in sort of a marine mammal perspective, but yeah, I'm definitely interested in broadening that. So you're speaking to the choir here, but what would you say are your top three or four issues that need to be addressed as a conservationist at this point? Probably the number one would be climate change, just because that's something that literally, like quite literally, encompasses everything. Like if you want to be humanitarian, focus on humanitarian issues, conservation, like marine mammals, everything. It's just sort of the umbrella over it all and will have an effect over every single ecosystem. Um, aside from that, probably, really that's, I think that's the huge one, but again, I think ocean conservation will probably be my number two just because I think that people sort of have this idea that you know here it is out here you've got to think the big vast ocean and it doesn't look like there's much that we could do to harm something so it appears big. infinite yeah exactly and that's we've certainly found that's most definitely not the case and I don't know one of my favorite quotes by like um, Dr. Sylvia Earle was sort of this what she said is there's no without blue there's no green so sort of saying that just goes to show how, again, how connected the terrestrial world and the oceanic world are in terms of playing off of each other for health. What's your opinion on ocean acidification and how that relates to climate change? Are you familiar with the biochemical reactions that occur there? Yeah, well, I think that obviously the biggest one that we've been able to see, and actually one that, I mean, I haven't been around for that long, I'm just a teenager, but I've, in my lifetime, been able to see the changes in coral reefs and places that I frequently visit in terms of snorkeling and diving and whatnot, and it's just really sad to see such amazing biodiversity dying off, mm -hmm. because, I mean, the coral reefs are some of the most biodiverse places in the entire world, and because of the, you know, the, the nature of what they're built off of, being the calcium carbonate and whatnot, the ocean acidification completely wrecks that. So, can you awful. can you tell us about the underwater laboratory that you helped uh, bring attention to and what's going on with that documentary and so forth? Yeah. Well, last time I was here, I actually flew in for like the last night. I think I was here for less than 24 hours, and I had just been in Florida in Key Largo visiting this place called the Aquarius, which was, which is still is the only remaining underwater research lab. And it was really, really a cool experience. I got to actually be down there with Dr. Sylvia Earle, which I mentioned, one of my favorite quotes from her before, and some really amazing other scientists. And it was just a really unique place to see because the amount of research they can get done in that kind of setting is just unparalleled to anything you could get diving off of a boat. So it was a really unique experience, but the sad part about it was that it was in danger of having the funding being cut. So luckily since then, it's been like two years since I was down there, they've, I'm not sure if they've 
bought the entire operation or if they just gave it, um, I guess, funding for the time being, but FIU down in Florida has it now and they're using it for research and whatnot. And Fabian Cousteau, who was actually down there when I was down there last time, just um, ran a mission called Mission 31, which was, he was down there with another group of scientists doing research for 31 days, which was kind of iconic because it, w it broke the record for the longest time researching underwater, which his grandfather had said before that. So. Can you comment um, on, the question came up last night, and I think everyone offered an optimistic response. I was probably the most pessimistic, but the future, I mean, how, how are we going to save the planet? That's a really daunting question. It is. Um, Sorry. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I necessarily have the answer of how we're going to save the planet. Honestly, like, again, because I spoke to you afterwards, being a realist, all of the signs are pointing to the fact that we're pretty doomed <laughs> at this point. But I don't know. It's whether or not how things turn out, I think that it's always good to try and be optimistic and to try and... <coughs> I mean, doing what you can and failing is better than not doing anything and failing. You end up the same place anyways, but at least you've tried to make something good out of it. So I think that, you know, if the world does get serious and decides that, you know, we want to solve this problem, there are going to be some really, really dramatic cutbacks that need to be made. But, I mean... Are we talking really about helpful. saving... We're not really talking about saving the planet, though. We're talking about saving ourselves. And we're talking about oh, yeah. how do we all figure out, you know, all seven billion of us to live on this on this particular planet because it's the only one that we know. I don't distinguish right between the two. <laughs> like, In fact, yeah. I'd rather sacrifice humanity for the sake well, that's, of the planet. I, that's what I'm saying. Like, ultimately, if we go, it, that might save the planet. Right. The collapse the, of industrial yeah, the, civilization. The collapse of humanity might and, save the and planet. Actually, and actually, and the fix yeah. is very simple. It's just like the fix at SeaWorld. The fix is super simple. It's population. Yep. And so yeah. until we can talk honestly about uh, about birth control and about you know limits to population growth, then we're not going to solve our problems. There was we're not going to get out of this through technology. <laughs> there, was a quote, there was a quote by one of the authors of the famous MIT paper published in 1972 called The Limits to Growth that shook up the world and, uh, and kind of got squashed by uh, capitalism. That One of the, the authors of that paper said, capitalism and democracy will not solve our problems. So what that suggests is some type of wholesale governmental shift in the way the planet is organized. Is there any way to visualize how that shift would occur? That's a tough question. Not without a lot of pain up front. Yeah. yeah. And, and so. take the emphasis off of progress. There's another movie called Surviving Progress. I mean, as long as it's like more, better, you know, more, higher earnings for shareholders, as long as it's all about more and more and more, that we, we're not we're not going to be in the right conversation. Yeah. Well, and like that's the thing. That's the thing that's what's hardest for people to accept is that in the whole way that we've got the world set up right now really isn't sustainable. But that's the way that it's been going for generations and generations. So in order to fix that, there's going to be have, there's going to have to be some sort of breakdown, which is obviously going to result in, I guess, it won't feel like short term, but some short term pain. Yeah. In order to sort of fix the system, and I just I think it seems to be that's something that most people aren't gonna. So what you're talking about is the phase that we're in now, which is called population overshoot, and there's going to be some type of collapse in how we manage to control that collapse or not is going to determine really the future of humanity probably. Is that accurate? Would you agree with that statement? Um, probably. I mean, I think that overpopulation is, if not, again, probably the three issues that are the biggest to address today. Overpopulation is most definitely one of those, and it's sort of one of those issues that people don't really know how to talk about and tend to tiptoe around it or just not talk about it at all, but it's sort of one of those things that a conversation needs to be started. Because, yeah, like the solutions to that probably may not be ideal for everyone and whatnot. But, again, it's something that the conversation at least needs to be started. Last question. And you were born in the USA, maybe Tennessee. Yeah. Is that right? And now you live in Victoria and just earned your dual citizenship. Yeah. Do you think the countries of the world can work together effectively to bring about the changes needed to keep us on the planet for another 50 years? Another 50. This is a long way that, out, right? Be, no, I was thinking the opposite. Right like now. That's a short way out? Mm -hmm. Well, when you just think about the, in order to, some of the changes that we could see within, within the next 50 years, just the change that we would have to make so quickly in our society today to prevent those from happening are quite, yeah, mm -hmm. it would be, it'd be difficult. But in terms of 
the world doesn't do a fantastic job of working together in total honesty, but I think that, again, if in light of everything, of the possibilities of how catastrophically awful in ter like the way that the world could be going right now, if there is sort of an instance where people grasp that a bit more than they do now, sort of the general public and hopefully world leaders as well, then I would only hope that we'd be able to work together towards a common goal. One last question to get you on camera saying this. Am I allowed to publish this on YouTube? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.